Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the August uh, 2023 edition of the NDSU Extension Agribusiness uh, Ag Market Situation Outlook webinar series. Uh, following the, the standard format, we'll have a series of presentations and answer questions at the end. Uh, fortunately, everybody can be here, I think, until the end of the program, so we can, we can field all the questions at that time. We ask that you use the Q&A tool or the chat tool if you prefer, uh, but uh, feel free to, to use that and we're happy to respond to any questions you have. Uh, with that, following the standard order, we'll kick it over to Brian. All right, thanks, Dave. Um, so we've covered a lot of topics this summer, um, a lot with the Fed and some other things, but today's uh, presentation is going to be on the most recent uh, USDA's land values and uh, rental data. Um, the report comes out every single August, um, about mid-August, uh, where the USDA uses survey data to put together their national um, land values and rents uh, report for both pasture and cropland. And so I'm going to focus on, on this presentation specifically on the national stuff. You've heard in the past, I've, I've talked about uh, North Dakota-specific uh, land prices and rents. So this one's going to be uh, nationally themed for the most part. So the first chart here shows uh, the USDA survey data for uh, cropland values in the U.S. from 2009 until uh, this year, 2023. And uh, what you notice right away is that you had, uh, since 2009, there have really been two periods. And if you went back before 2009, it looks pretty flat as well of uh, land price increases for cropland uh, nationally. And that the big one, the one uh, before this most recent uh, kind of started in 2010 and concluded in 2013 or 14, where land prices across the U.S. pretty much moved sideways for, uh, you know, almost eight years or so from $4,100 nearly in 2014 to $4,100 in 2020. I mean, that's as flat as it gets. But do you look at the last three years or so and in 2000 in uh, uh, 22, there was a 14 percent, 14.3 percent increase from 2020 to 2021, almost an 8 percent, 7.8. And then the most recent year, 8.1 percent. So the big the biggest jump occurring from 20, uh, 2021 to 2022, that's that 14.3 percent increase last year and the <clears throat> and then. Last year, 8.1%, and then from 2020 to 2021, 7.8. So almost two years of 8% increases, sandwiching 14% uh, a year ago. And so that's kind of what we've seen taking place. And there have been some talks about uh, things slowing down a little bit compared to a year ago. And that's what they're talking about with this 7.8% uh, increase or 8.1% uh, uh, increase compared to 143 and if you look at the map, this is put put out by USDA and they divide it into regions. Uh, with the USDA's data, North Dakota's cropland uh, in the last year increased about 13%, 13.2, up to an average cropland value of 26.60. Uh, nowhere near the highest price stuff, obviously. That's, you know, Iowa at uh, 10,000 bucks an acre. Uh, Illinois, nearly $10,000 an acre. Indiana, $8,500 an acre. Ohio, $8,200 an acre. Down into Nebraska, almost $7,000, $6,800 an acre. So North Dakota up pretty sharply. And if you go across the river uh, from at least from Fargo into Minnesota, um, you know, $6,800 an acre and up 10%. So actually North Dakota increased last year uh, more than uh, Minnesota did. And this map kind of lays out the darker the red, the more expensive the cropland is. Uh, and then the lighter colored, uh, more yellow or manila colored is, is generally less expensive. And then they also track pasture land values as well. And this shows the same thing. There was a modest increase, not nearly as much as cropland uh, from 2010 to 2014, uh, when we saw uh, record high cattle prices during that time up to almost $1,300 an acre nationally. And then you look, the last uh, three years or so, pasture land prices across the country have, have increased pretty sharply. Up last year, uh, from, from, from last year to this year, almost 7%, 6.7. Uh, but the year before, almost 15% from, from, from 2021 to 2022. 
and then 5.7, almost 6% from 20 to 21. So similar to what happened with cropland prices, uh, a, a big jump uh, a year ago, but instead of around 8%, you know, closer to seven and then, and then um, uh, 5.7 the year, uh, two years ago uh, with that increase. So increases in pasture land, um, very noticeable, uh, pretty big jumps, but uh, not quite at the magnitude that cropland prices have increased across the country. And then this is the same kind of map as the one that the USDA puts out for cropland prices, but this one pertains to pasture land. And you can see North Dakota had a pretty sizable increase in pasture land prices. It's a little fuzzy there, but 15, that, that's supposed to be about 15%. Uh, with North Dakota's pasture land prices on average going over the thousand dollar an acre mark um, for the first time. And again, not as expensive as some other states. Uh, you get into the, the southeast and pasture land prices can be three thousand dollars an acre. I always caution though when we're talking about pasture land prices to really make sure that if you're if you're really deep diving into the comparisons between say the southeast or Florida and places like Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, or Texas, you look at it in dollars per AUM. Everything tends to be reported in dollars per acre because it's simple and everyone's comfortable with it. But there is a big difference between the stocking rates in the Southeast versus the stocking rates in the mountain states or the Northern Plains, where in the Southeast, you might get away with two acres for a cow-calf pair. In other places, it's you know 15 acres for a cow-calf pair. So you got to make that adjustment and look at it from a dollars per AUM basis to see what is truly more expensive one versus the other. And the same is true for cropland, of course. I mean, some some areas are more productive than others, but it's a little more standardized and a little more well understood. And you don't see as dramatic uh, as as a chain as differences so much as you do with uh, pasture land prices. So economic regions, uh, these are the regions that uh, uh, the USDA uses, I put a little indicator in case anyone forgot that North Dakota is this really northern trapezoidal state at the top of the country right here. We're in the northern plains region. All right. And I just wanted to show this is a, a, a table that's put out by the USDA as well. And actually last year, for, so from last year to this year, the northern plains, which are these four states, Kansas, Nebraska, and the Dakotas, had the highest uh Cropland and pasture land increases on average as a region. So the Northern Plains increased at 14.1%. Okay. And then pasture land values uh, for the Northern Plains increased 13.5% um, with North Dakota up there with uh, uh, Nebraska and Kansas 15.1 for us, South Dakota the lowest. But uh, our region increased uh the large uh the largest amount now one thing that's that's also tr tends to be true and i'm just going to back up here and you look at this map you see iowa from a year ago increased eight percent and i use them because they're one of the leaders in in cropland price increases and what tends to happen a lot of times when we have these increases in cropland prices compared to from north dakota compared to like the corn belt where we tend to be a year behind um, so if, and what I mean by that is if, if there's a big increase in the corn belt, North Dakota is going to have an increase as well, but it's going to be a year behind those other states. They're going to move fast and early and North Dakota is going to lag by a year. So they had a bigger jump last year in the corn belt than, than we did here in the Northern Plains. And so it's almost like we're kind of catching up and they, they've slowed down. So if, if that pattern were to hold true, Next year, we'll, we'll, we'll slow down to closer to, you know, that 8% mark if, if, you know, conditions don't change a lot. So that's, I just, something to keep in mind that when you maybe read some articles about a big jump in, in cropland prices in Iowa or Illinois or something like that, and, and then the year's data comes out in North Dakota's at 7% and they were at 11, chances are if things remain, we're going to catch up the following year. And that's, that's what we see happen a lot. So let's talk about rents real quick. Uh, they don't uh, USDA doesn't make their own chart make their own charts for rents. So I have to I use their data, but I have to make my own charts for those. And 2023 uh, was the, the the biggest increase last year to this year, uh, and then the year before we had 4.7 percent and 5 percent a year earlier, 
And then that uh, 2020 to 2021 period, about 1.4% increase in cropland rents. So nationally, it averages about 155 bucks an acre. And you can see the increases kind of started uh, in 2021 after being pretty flat uh, following that run up that occurred in two, from 2009 to 2014. So rents have followed, but not nearly as, as high in magnitude. And then pasture land rents uh, have increased. Uh, these are small numbers, you know, averaging 13 bucks an acre in 2021 up to $15 an acre. So I just said from, you know, that's 15.4%. Uh, it's a much obviously lower dollar amount than cropland prices. So a dollar increase from 13 to 14 can be a, a bigger, big jump percentage wise. But nonetheless, we can see that it is increasing uh, quite a bit. And then so one of the last things I wanted to say on this, just kind of showing what's going on, gone on nationally, is uh, rental rates versus land values and what's happened. So since 2020, cropland values are up 33.2%. That's in total, not per year, but from 2020 to now, according to USDA data nationally, cropland values are up 33%. Since that, in that same period of time, cropland rents are up about 11.5%, so 11.5 here. And then we look at pasture land. Since 2020, pasture land values are up 25 and a half, almost 26%. And pasture land rents are up 15.4%. So not, not nearly as much as pasture land values. So if we use the cap rate, which, which a lot of folks use, I know, to kind of look at a rate of return on farmland, and I realize it's imperfect, and I didn't uh, uh, put in some equity accumulation in there, but even that notwithstanding, I also didn't. Uh, deduct property taxes, which is often done if you're doing a, an official cap rate for it. The national cropland cap rates, therefore, have dropped to 2.8%. So that's just taking the average cropland price, um, taking the average rent, I should say, for cropland and dividing by the, the market price of cropland. That comes out at 2.8%. If you deduct taxes, it's probably closer to 2.5, 2.4 right now. Um, it's hard to get a national average um, tax rate because they vary widely, whether you're in Nebraska, North Dakota, whatever. And then pasture land uh, cap rates uh, barely hitting 1%. It's actually below 1%. I had to round up to get to 1%. And so I asked the question, um, with interest rates approaching 8% now, uh, last I checked, they were around 7.1, 7.2 on the 30-year. And uh, the Fed's minutes coming out here recently suggest some more rate hikes may be coming, um, which may push them up to 8%. You know, how long do we think that these um, rents are going to stay so low relative to cropland prices? I mean, and I, I realize a lot of folks may say where rents are, well, they're not really that low. Well, they're only 2.8% of, of the market value. And if you have to borrow at seven, seven and a half percent, maybe eight, you know, what kind of rate of return do you need to have before it looks like a decent investment? And then the second thing is, I just pulled this out because I've actually had some conversations with people recently talking about possibly buying farmland or something like that. And this was just pulled today, the current CD rates for FDIC insured deposits, like I said, as of yesterday. And you can right now get a, a one, and I, I think I pulled these from Edward Jones, but a one-year CD at 5.3%, uh, a three-year at 4.8%. Uh, you know, you compare that to 2.8%, uh, five, five and a half percent looks a whole lot better than, than a 2.8% rate of return uh, and possibly lower when you put in taxes. So is that going to start, if, are, are people going to start making decisions looking at these, what are my other options for investing this money? Well, I can get a guaranteed five and a half percent or so, five and a quarter, and my money's only tied up for a year, or I can possibly make a big down payment, borrow the rest at 7%, and I'm I'm hoping I'm getting a two and a half percent rate of return, or that the capital gain on farmland's high enough year over year that it that it that it makes up the difference. I don't know right off, uh, right away. I'm not I'm not trying to make any any declarations based on that. Only just pointing out that that's where things stand right now, and it's the first time in a long time uh, that you know you're looking at CDs as a a very real. If you're on a fixed income uh, or soon to be on a fixed income, and you've got some money socked away in a safe, 
haven for it that's going to generate a guaranteed rate of return. These CD CD returns aren't aren't half bad. So, you know, that's all I wanted to touch on today uh, was just um, talking about what the USDA's report has said. There isn't anything too uh, shocking in there, uh, especially when we had uh, North Dakota's reports that that we put out back in April. I, for the most part, expected what I saw. Uh, but but the environment's actually changed since since then when we're talking about these rates of returns of both interest rates where they are now and rates of returns on some of these traditionally what are considered very safe investment alternatives like a CD. So uh, with I will be around to answer some questions here later on. Uh, but with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Frain Olson. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Brian. I'll start sharing my screen. And just double check that you can see that okay. I'm assuming everything's working right. All right. So uh, I actually have a lot of material to burn through today. Um, so I'm going to go through this relatively quickly, kind of at a higher level. Um, again, I'll be around for questions. So please, as we're going through, think of what your questions might be. If I didn't cover it, I, I, I apologize, but I'll do my best to try and answer anything that you um, that you think about or want to discuss some more. Um, so here's my contact information. I usually throw this up here. So if there is something that comes up later on or you want to visit uh, privately or off offline, I'd be happy to do that. So with that, we will get together kind of what are the current market issues? What, you know, short term for the next uh, couple of weeks or so, what are the what are going to be the things we spend the most time talking about? Uh, because of the stage of the year we're in and the forecast for weather, which I'll talk about in just a minute, um, yield projections are still going to be, you know, the the highlight. Those are going to be the things that will get the highest attention. Um, just as an update, now that I'm promoting this, I'm just recommending that you pay attention. Uh, Pro Farmer has our crop tour starting next week, uh, August twenty first through the twenty third or fourth, excuse me. Um, I know that uh, garners a lot of attention. There's going to be a lot of. Um, social media posts talking about it and and their their findings. Um, I also, in a few minutes, I'm going to show you some crop condition ratings, uh, or at least uh, some vegetative health ratings, and, and probably targeting some areas that if we do have some issues or problems showing up, that they might show up. Obviously, the other part to that equation, because we are in the uh, critical development stages, especially for soybeans, Corn Belt weather is going to be uh, watched very, very closely also. Um, there are some things going on yet with the Ukraine-Russia war and the ability of both Ukraine and Russia to be able to export, uh, both sell as well as export ship uh, the the products. Uh, this is really a primarily a corn and, and to some degree a wheat market issue. So the oil seeds are not going to be as impacted, but it is something we need to be pay paying attention to and can obviously turn things very quickly. So let's talk very quick update. Uh, we got updates on the ending stocks forecast for old crop, which was which as of the end of August now, we're going to be closing out the 2022-23 year. So USDA starting to make those little fine tuning refinements uh, before the official closeouts. We got one more uh, um, on September 1, we'll have a, a uh, survey of, of um, inventories. So that will become the ending inventory for old crop, it'll become the beginning inventory for new crop. Now, there were a couple adjustments. The one that I want to note the most, most of these are kind of rounding error from the old crop standpoint. But but one of the things that is starting to happen now, the and, and it's a bit troubling on my from my perspective, is the the drop in corn ending stocks. So if you look at what this report is really quick, and I'll I'll be consistent across the way at the top. Highlighted in blue is what the average trade estimate was. That's what the, the private forecasters and analysts were expecting to see. The black highlighted or bolded line towards the bottom is what was reported last month. And then on the very bottom and highlighted in red is the actual number that we received. So a couple of different ways to think about it. Usually the market response is the blue line relative to the red line. But I'm talking about the difference between the black line and the red line. So what was that adjustment? What was that changes? There was some nibbling around the edges and some tweaks here and there. The biggest difference, which again is concerning a bit to me, is that the USDA did drop corn exports by another 25 million bushels. 
And and so it seems like for the last several months, their forecasts or projections for corn exports, both old crop as well as new crop, have been softening. And and I do think as we move forward into the summer, or excuse me, into the harvest and post harvest period, those export sales are going to be really, really critical and very important. So I wanted to bring that up a little bit because as we move from old crop into new crop, these ending stocks from old crop become beginning stocks in new crop. So when I talk about the new crop numbers and all the adjustments that were made, just recognize one of those adjustments was we're carrying more grain forward from last year into this year, into this cropping year. Uh, so now when we shift to new crop, so the top row now, what the trade was expecting to see was in green. On the bottom in red is what we actually actually got from a USDA number standpoint. Uh, on the wheat side, a slight increase in the wheat numbers. Again, some small tweaks here and there. Most of that was due to some yield increases. I'll talk about that in just a moment. On the corn uh, balance sheet, we actually got, a we, we were expecting a reduction in ending stocks for corn. We're expecting some of those, those yield numbers to come in a little bit lower, which I'll show you in a minute, and, which happened. But that reduction or that cut in, in ending stocks was a little bit larger than expected, larger than anticipated. So somewhat, I would call it neutral to somewhat supportive for corn, because when you look at the highest estimate and the lowest estimate, we're still pretty much in that mid-range. Even though there are some bushel differences, we're still within that range of kind of what we expected to see. On the soybean, um, we we did tighten up the ending stocks again for for new crop soybeans. Uh, the the yield forecast was brought down a little bit, which we anticipated. But again, those those numbers came in a little bit lower. The adjustments to the balance sheet, both production and consumption, tighten up that ending stocks a bit more than what the trade was expecting. So again, not that it was a big shock value. We really didn't see a lot of big market news or market movements. When, when the report was released uh, last Friday, uh, but we did see some minor adjustments. So I this is the table for wheat. So one of the things that we're starting to do now is not only have farmer survey-based estimates of, of wheat yields, which is a survey base. We are using, USDA is using the satellite imagery or remote sensing, which I'll talk about a, a bit more in a minute, but they're also doing what they call objective yield surveys. So they're actually going into the fields and trying to do some testing and some, some um, actual sampling to get better ideas what test weights and, and et cetera are gonna be looking like. So we did get an update on all wheat as well as all winter wheat, and then we break it down by class, hard red winter, soft red winter, white, uh, other spring, which is primarily hard red spring wheat, but there is some, some white spring wheat included, and of course the Durham numbers. So this is, production. So these are total bushels produced. It's not ending stocks. Uh, notice that we did take the spring wheat production levels down just a little bit. Um, we also had a slight increase in the Durham number. Now, I'm not going to put a lot of pressure on these numbers right now because there's still a lot of things that can happen. And in, in particular in Durham, in, in my assessment, that's kind of rounding error difference between what we saw, what the trade was expecting, and what what we actually got. So, because uh, there aren't a lot of private estimates that, that that come in for the Durham numbers. So, when we look at all wheat, we did take a little bit off the top end of the wheat, but the uh, some of the winter wheat numbers came in a bit stronger than people were expecting. Moving on to the big story, which of course was what is the corn and soybean yield going to do? And the reason the August forecast is so important is because uh, USDA moves away from trend line and adjusting the trend line up and down a little bit to again, actually field surveys. They're surveying farmers. Um, they surveyed about 14,600 farmers across the US and asked them what their best estimate of their their average corn and soybean yields were going to be. Um, and they'd accumulated that over nationally. But they also, again, used the satellite imagery, uh, in particular in those areas where they feel that there's going to be some problems or trouble spots to try and get a better idea of what, what is the size of that trouble area. And in a few years ago, we had a derecho storm, that big windstorm that came through Iowa. And they used remote sensing or that satellite imagery to try and identify about how many acres or how what how large of Iowa was actually hit and damaged by that 
relative to what what um, um, you know the rest of the state looked at. So again, the blue line on top is what the trade was expecting. Uh, the black line is what we got last month, and then the red line on the very bottom is what the USDA numbers actually came out with. So again, very close. The 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 private estimates as well as the USDA uh, numbers matched up very closely. We did get a slight reduction in both corn and soybean yields. Um, so far, they haven't made any major shifts or adjustments in harvested acreage. Uh, but I, um, some colleagues, Dave Ripplinger and John Biermacher, and I just got back from Kansas City, Missouri at, at a national conference of our peers that do the outlook with an extension. And one of the comments that was made for some of those drought areas, in particular in Wisconsin and possibly parts of, of Nebraska, as well as Minnesota, we may see a little bit higher corn abandonment this year because of chopping the corn silage than we normally would. Um, now that has not been factored yet into these corn production numbers. So we're taking the top end off the the the, the uh, corn estimates. We're taking a little bit off the top end of the soybean estimates. So I'm going to show you some maps in just a moment, and I'm going to highlight a few things because what I, one of the thing one of my big takeaways from our meeting in Kansas City, which I, I understood and thought about, but I really didn't put into context, is we're really starting to see again a very big difference between yield estimates and expectations coming out of the Eastern Corn Belt versus the Western Corn Belt. Now in, in, in marketing language, what that means is we're kind of using the Mississippi River, uh, which is really that dividing line between Iowa and Illinois, and then runs all the way down to the Gulf. We're kind of using the, that as the, the, the imaginary dividing line between the Eastern Corn Belt and the Western Corn Belt. And, and you'll start to see some of these differences show up in just a moment as I go through what the USDA yield forecasts are by state. So we got the national numbers, but then we have the state numbers. And I know in the past, I've spent quite a bit of time talking about some of the weather conditions and concerns and drier soil moisture conditions in the Western Corn Belt, because that was the area of greatest interest. That was the area that people are really talking about. But we cannot forget what's going on in the Eastern Corn Belt. And I was I was reminded of that very strongly at our national meetings, because the Eastern Corn Belt right now, based on everything we see, is going to have a really good corn and soybean crop. Um, and, and so we have to be very careful about getting um, kind of this backyard syndrome and worrying too much about what's going on in our neighborhood and forgetting about what's happening at the national level. So the darker the green, the more bushels are produced. So this is based on bushel count, not planted acreage and not yields. This is how many bushels are produced. So again, darker green, more bushels. Notice that we have this pocket. We have Northern Illinois, uh, Central and Northern Iowa, Southern Minnesota, uh, parts of Eastern North Dakota and Eastern South Dakota, and of course, a, a big portion of Nebraska. So remind everybody, this is what USDA forecast for yield by state was. And I want to explain very quickly, the top number is their current estimate for the, for the yield in that state. And then the number underneath it is the percentage change, percentage increase or decrease from the previous year. So in this case, let's just look at Iowa. They're still projecting or forecasting a 203 bushel statewide average yield which is down about one and a half percent from the previous previous year, from last year's numbers. So when we start looking at these numbers, notice that whenever there's a, a hatch mark or, or a, a pound sign or a hashtag, uh, that means that it's a record year or a record production. Now, the reason that Illinois is down 6% from last year is last year was their record production year. So we have to realize Illinois is coming off a record corn uh, yield number from last year. So look at the Eastern Corn Belt. We're looking at you know 191 for Ohio, 195 for Illinois, a uh, little over 200 for uh, Illinois, a little over 200 for uh, Iowa, a 184 for Nebraska. So this core, and then a 183 for Minnesota. So this core corn producing area is, even though there's some stress areas, there's some problems showing up, these numbers are still very strong numbers. And as we went around the room and talked to the, the specialists, the people that have my job or Tim's job across the nation, 
they they looked at these numbers and said, you know, based on their conversations with farmers and industry and what they saw driving up and down the road, they would not have any major argument or disagreement with those numbers as of today. So I got confirmation from my professional peers that these numbers seem to be reasonable based upon what they're currently seeing. For soybeans, again, the corn belt is the corn belt, right? That's where the core corn and soybeans are produced. But for soybeans, we have a little bit broader trade territory. So we, we have a little bit heavier concentration up here in the Dakotas and the northern growing regions. But we also have this Mississippi River Valley. And many times we forget about all of the soybeans that are growing along this Mississippi River Valley. And that's really important when we think about national average yields and what that means for the soybean supply. Now, some of this is gonna be single crop, some of this is gonna be double crop soybeans. So they have taken, they planted, for example, winter wheat, harvested the winter wheat, replanted soybeans, a shorter season soybean, and then coming back and actually double cropping in one production cycle. So some of these are going to be full season beans, which the much higher yield potential. Some of them will have produced a wheat crop first and then followed it with the soybean crop. So again, just geography, I just want to recenter everybody on where are those core soybean producing regions. So now let's look at the states. What are the major states that produce soybeans? And again, what kind of yield potential are we, are we looking at? So if you look at the major states, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, um, Iowa, Minnesota, Nebraska, and then we get up into the Dakotas here, the Eastern Corn Belt, including Kentucky, which has quite a, quite a few soybean acres in today's world. Um, you know, those are looking at some very, very good yields. Now, uh, Illinois and Iowa are a little bit lower than last year, but again, recognizing last year was a really, really good year in that part of the country. We are looking at the drought monitor map. So, you know, the, the the story that I did get was a lot of the crops are living rain shower to rain shower, right? But they are recognizing that in Iowa and Illinois, they often get, a, even on a normal basis, an inch or so a week. So they tend to have more rainfall than we do. So this living from rain to shower to rain shower is a little bit easier in the Corn Belt than it is up here in the Northern Plains. Now, based off that, that uh, map I just showed you from the uh, Dr um, National Drought Mo Mitigation Center out of the University of, of Nebraska and Lincoln, that same group puts together what they call a vegetative drought response index. I've talked about this before. And th what they're doing is they're taking the, the, the vegetative health index, that, that satellite imagery of how green is the crop, and they're accumulating it. They're adding it up over time from planting season until this, this date. And they're comparing that to what would they normally see at this time of year. So this is an accumulation throughout the whole growing season. And, and there are some pockets. There's some areas, especially early on, that did have some drought stress, in particular in western Iowa. Uh, when you get into southern and, and, and the, the eastern portion of Nebraska, when you get into eastern Kansas and obviously up here in the northeast corner of, of North Dakota. So, um, you know, these are the areas that as we're going through that crop tour, if you're going to start hear, hearing some, some areas that don't have the, the kind of the yield potential or there's some concerns showing up, it will, in my opinion, will likely be in these areas. So do not be surprised if we get into um, um, eastern um, and kind of east central Iowa and you start hearing some reports that, things aren't looking quite as good as what they were hoping for or even into Southern um, Minnesota here. Now, if another way of looking at this is, and again, this is a different source, we're still using NDVI, that vegetative health index, but we're scoring it differently. All we're doing is we're taking the, the pictures this week saying what kind of greenness do we see this week, this, this week of the production year relative to history. So are we above average or below average in, in, in kind of greenness of the crop, given what we see today. So it's not an accumulation. So what's happened before is irrelevant. It we're just taking a snapshot of today. And we're saying, if we take a snapshot today, how does today compare to this same week over time? What we normally see at this time of year. Now, normal, if you look down in the very bottom in blue here, I have highlighted the formal definition. So normal is the average, the historical average from 2000 um, to basically last year to present, okay? So if you notice the scaling over here, 
when we think about the greenness of the crop, is it about the same as we would normally see? Is it about 5% less, 15% less, or is it 5% greater or 15% greater? Now, notice when you get into those core Corn Belt areas, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Indi um, Iowa, even into Nebraska, most of those, with the, with the exception of a few pockets up here that are a little bit behind, most of that area is normal or slightly above. Now, this is for all crops, not just corn and soybeans. The reason that we're seeing these red marks into Arkansas, Missouri, and parts of Kentucky is they've actually had excessive rainfall. And so they're starting to get a little bit of the yellowing of the crop simply because the soil moistures are so high. They've had, they've had a lot of rainfall over the last uh, couple of weeks and, and it's starting to show some stress in the crop. So as we look forward, recognizing, and I'm gonna look at the crop progress report, that about 78% of the Iowa corn crop right now is in the dough stage or the filling stage. About 71% of Illinois is in the filling stage or past the flowering stage in, this, in the central part of the corn belt. And that um, we've got about 87% uh, of the Iowa a soybean crop is setting pods and about 80% of the Illinois crop is setting pods. So right now, from from crop development standpoint, soybeans are going to be more sensitive to the temperature and growing conditions than corn will be. Corn can still be impacted both positively and negatively, but not as dramatically as, let's say, the soybean crop. So if we look at the extended forecast, not only coming into this weekend, but into next week, the temperatures are expected to, to, to rebuild. There's a high pressure system that's supposed to rebuild over the central part of the U.S., bringing a lot of heat into that core growing area. So there's a, an average or, or excuse me, a, above average probability of above average temperatures. Um, so we've gotta be conscious of that and the, and the markets are starting to pay attention to the fact that in particular soybeans, which have tighter ending stocks to begin with, may be um, in more jeopardy because of this temperature. On top of that, when you look at the extended forecast for rainfall, they're not expected to get any major rain showers coming through. Again, there's, there's a chance for some spotty showers. Some areas may pick up a little bit of rain, but as far as a widespread rain event, there really isn't any major event like that shaping up you know, from the weekend on into next week. So these weather conditions on top of current crop conditions, the information we got from the from USDA saying, well, what do we think will happen to, to crop yields? What is the trend line or the, the re rephrase that? What is the adjustments that we might see in crop yields and yield potential as we move into kind of this tail end of the growing season? So a lot of things to talk about. There's a lot of information that we're trying to process right now. We have had quite a bit of pullback in both corn and soybean prices, which has taken wheat with us, at least temporarily. Um, it looks as though we might be setting some short-term bottoms in both corn and soybeans right now over the last couple of days. Uh, I hope that's correct. We'll have to wait to see. And I do think that this, this weather concern about hot and dry uh, conditions returning into the corn belt is, is putting us, giving us a little bit of a lift back into the, into the marketplace. So that was my last slide. Um, I will try and take a breath now and hand things over to Tim Petrie. Good, Good afternoon, afternoon, everybody. Tim, Tim Petrie, Petrie here, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. Uh, we start, our last webinar was on uh, July 13th, and I left off saying that the semi-annual cattle inventory would be coming out a week later, and we were anxiously looking forward to that. Our expectation, obviously, would be that the cow herd, particularly on the beef side, the beef cow herd would be down because of the high beef cow slaughter and the severe drought in the last couple of years. And so the report did come out, and here it is. I'm not going to concentrate on the black numbers here, but mainly just the change over a year ago, and you know our expectations held true. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through every market class here, but hit some highlights with the purple arrows there. So we start off on... With beef cows there, we're down 2.6%, uh, and uh, that uh, 29.4 million head is significant. Talk about that in the next chart. Beef replacement heifers down 2.4%. Another thing that I'm going to discuss is some people say, well, 
you know, uh, this is what producers said would be replacement heifers, but, you know, if, if conditions are appropriate, they, the other heifer category, uh, you could always put a bull in with some of those, but you see there are other heifers are down 5% as well. So that means, you know, our heifer supply is down. And then on the bottom, uh, I think significant for fall calf prices in particular is that category is the number of uh, feeder and calves outside of feedlots, not yet in feedlots. Our cattle on feed is down 2.2%, which is funneling into the fed cattle price that we'll talk about in a minute. But our supply is down 3.6%, so that means we'll have 3.6% less calves uh, to, to sell, sell this fall and into spring, spring with background and so on. So obviously that's very, very supportive to prices with those lower numbers and the significant of that probably shows up more here. This is a busy slide, but uh, the July 1st report is uh, much less detailed than the January report. We have to wait for January to see uh, the uh, state by state numbers, actually county by county numbers, to see where uh, drought may be affecting us most. So this is really a foreshadow of what we can expect for the January report. But anyway, uh, on the top end is beef cows, and uh, you see this is the fifth straight year then of liquidation, and so our expectations for the January report will follow that through of significance is uh, the previous cyclical low in beef cow numbers. This is for the July report was in 2014 at 29.75 million head is showing up there. This July, we are down to 29.4 below 2014. Why is 2014 significant? Well, again, that was the previous cyclical low and the previous cyclically, cyclical high uh, in prices. And so we even have fewer beef cows than we had back then. Uh, and uh, then going down to the bottom, again, we mentioned beef replacement heifers. And you see there, uh, again, very low numbers. And in fact, uh, both beef cows and beef replacement heifers are at record low numbers going back to 1993. The January report goes back to 1920, but here we the July, they just started in 1993 and didn't report in 2013 and 16 because of uh, money problems in D.C. But uh, record low numbers since 1993, again, very, very supportive of the prices. So, you know, the question is, when is beef cow herd rebuilding going to start? It isn't if it's going to start. It's going to start sometime because our numbers are very historically low. But when is it going to start? is the big question, and that obviously depends a lot on rainfall, and Frank showed you the drought monitor map. On the left-hand side, then, is just USDA takes the drought monitor map and puts that on the top of the map, like he showed the production numbers where soybeans are produced, and then he showed you the drought monitor map here. It's the same on the left-hand side. The dark green are the beef cow areas, again, going right up from Texas through North Dakota, and neighboring states there is where a lot of cattle are. Well, there's some over in, in the Appalachian states, and some down in Florida, and some California. So and then superimposed on top of that with the red dash lines is where drought is. And so uh, there is drought, again, like he mentioned, through uh, Kansas and Nebraska and up into northeastern North Dakota and so on. But uh, key, I think, is down in the bottom left. 34% of our beef cows are still in drought. But uh, again, a lot of improvement because what did this map look like back uh, in October of last year, last late last fall? And so you see there a lot more widespread drought into the Appalachian states. Uh, California was very, very dry. And so a lot of improvement there. 76% of the beef cows were in drought last October. That's why we had the big liquidation of cows and why have fewer cows. We have seen improvement, but you know, still a third of the beef cows are in drought. So first of all, we don't, you know, our numbers are down, our beef replacement heifers are down, and also we still have some drought. So that uh, is that going to continue to improve? And uh, that's when, uh, you know, the major beef 
how uh, increases will take place. So we just kind of have to wait and see. Prices are sending the signal to rebuild the herd, but we have to wait for precipitation. So we'll go to the different market classes then of cattle and just start off with fed steers like I usually do. And again, I've been through the color coding green on the bottom. Is the, I leave that four years on here in 2020 was just a, a terrible year with COVID and everything. But the red line is what we currently are doing and just had steady progress, kind of leveled off since June. We picked uh, there at the first week in June, we had an all-time a record high cattle prices on a weekly basis of uh, 188.75 or 2.99 on a dress basis, and basically have just been about there. Last week we were right at 186 for an average, and so we're usually in the summer we do go down when the big slaughter hits, but since we're so short of numbers and demand is holding very well, the, uh, I didn't bring the cutout slide. I think I showed it to you last time. The beef cutout is holding in there. Uh, very well, you know, 15% above where it was last year. So beef is moving. So, you know, fed cattle prices are, are up there in the in mid 180s and the red squares there are the futures market for the rest of the year, August and October and December, the red bars and showing similar prices up there. So. Uh, USDA is forecasting an average price for the year of 178.50, uh, and, uh, would be significant above the last record high of, uh, 153.84 back in 2014. So we're at record high prices and expect them to continue in the gold squares and our, the futures next year at higher levels with USDA predicting next year on the cash uh, basis here of 185.50. So looks like strong prices, which are again supportive of the feeder cattle. Uh, you know, I've been, if you've been reading the press about calf prices, a lot of terms like they're off the charts and literally that's almost what's happening on my uh, chart here is they're almost off the chart. Kind of interesting. Again, go back to, uh, COVID year and the, and usually mid October is our low price there where we're down at 150 and we're bouncing right up there near 300, 292 last week, a doubling in price since 2020. So a very nice increase again going up, uh, throughout the year. And, and so, uh, it's going to be a much better year for, uh, calf prices this year. I do expect seasonal weakness that occurs. And again, probably focus in on that October, uh, 15th time frame, but you know, they're uh, $84 right now, higher than they were last year. And so even if they come off 15 or 20, still going to be significantly higher than last year. One other um, thing that I use to say what prices might be this fall is just to look at the video auctions going on now for November delivery. Here was the Northern Livestock out of Billings there at the end of July, July 27th. And uh, circled in blue on the left hand uh, upper towards the upper hand. These are for November delivery calves, and I just brought the 550 to six pound categories there on the top. But you know, you you see a wide range in prices there for the for the big numbers there. The third one down over 3,000 head uh, range in prices of 283 and the low end to up to 313. Even some value added up on the top line there up to 321. But uh, on that third line there, an average of 292. And so kind of interesting on my chart, that's what calves were uh, last week in North Dakota on the average of 292. But again, there's a wide range and there will be a wide range in prices this fall and markets for all the different factors that affect calves from you know, have they had their shots or weaning and now actually providing data on the implants that they may or may not have will be important for uh, uh, discounting or, or putting premiums on calves. So, uh, you know, a 283 to 313 price is what it looks like for this fall at auction markets. And, and again, much better than last year. There's the heavier weight yearling prices, kind of the same thing. They're up $73 over last year, 258 last year. But again, I think we sold some nearly 750 weight uh, really nice steers at rugby last week for 
uh, you know, 270, 270 or something. something. So, so a wide, wide range there. there. There's the futures market again saying, we, we're running a positive basis to the futures market now because a lot happens a lot of times when we're short of cattle. And uh, so, uh, you know, uh, very good prices this fall. And again, the next year, uh, much higher than they were at the beginning of next year and maybe even a little bit above. So uh, good prices there, barring, uh, you know, the really getting dry in the corn belt. Again, just remember that. Change corn prices ten cents. Change feeder cattle. Uh, fed calf prices a buck in the opposite direction. So, Rain mentioned the growth in the corn belt or dryness in the corn belt, and the trade is starting to see that. So that's the big thing we need to watch here in the next week or so. So again, uh, you know, we're in the upward part of the cat uh, increasing phase of the cattle price cycle, but I think. Uh, you know, the, we're near and near to selling calves now, but when we start getting into the backgrounding programs, and I'll talk more about that in, in a future day, in future uh, webinars here in the next few months, uh, you know, they're going in at a very, very high value there, and so you're at risk for calves coming out in March or whenever, February, March, April, when they might be background. So, you know, I wouldn't throw price risk management out the window because if you're selling them all in one day or so on, you're at the mercy of that. But the best marketing strategy there, I think, if you're interested in price risk management, is to uh, do a floor price but leave the top side open because we're going to be short of cattle. And right now the demand is good. We don't know what's going to happen to corn, though. So something like a livestock risk protection or futures market options might be something to consider. Oh, just want to end up. Uh, a little bit, I haven't talked about lamb prices for a while, and lamb prices the last year or so have been extremely volatile. Uh, you know, the, on the left-hand side there, the light blue line there is last year again, and there in April and May, $250 lambs, and then the bottom just completely fell out of them in the summer, and so by now they were down to uh, $95, but... Uh, uh, seen a nice increase, the red line again back up this year to average to above average, and now uh, uh, last week averaging up here in the northern plains about uh, 205, so we're back up into respectable prices for lambs. So sold a lamb, a load of lambs out of Tappan on uh, a week ago today, brought, they were really nice lambs and shorn lambs, which may tend to be a little premium for uh, 221.50. So the main reason is why the price went down so dramatically and now why we're back up is simply that uh, uh, when prices started going down, feedlots held lambs, they got too heavy, and uh, and so uh, the number of lambs built up. The, the uh, box on the right then is uh, every month the USDA does a survey of, uh, of the feeder lamb inventory mainly in Colorado. And so those numbers kind of bear that out down there. Uh, last year at, on August 1st, we had over 88,000 lambs on feed. Again, there was a backlog and they were heavy and some weighing as much as 200 pounds. And this year in August, we've got less than half of that, 42,800. So we're back to current where they're not too heavy. Again, those lambs out of tap and weighed 140 pounds uh, versus they were discounting over 155 pound lambs last year and had them as much as up to 200 pound lambs and all of those lambs backed up. So we're back to, you know, what you might call a normal or average situation and, and um, much improved there and, and hope we can stay that way. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Dave. Yeah, so I'm going to make some comments about renewable diesel again. Uh, a lot going on in the market. It's it's continuing to steadily grow, and has certainly re reached the size where it's of, of national importance. Uh, although there's still folks who sometimes ask if it's even a real thing, uh, and it most certainly is. Uh, so this is a chart using data from the Department of Energy, and this is nationwide uh, showing consumption uh, within the country of both biodiesel, which is the yellow, and renewable diesel. Uh, which is the grain. As you can see, the, the grain has increased dramatically just in the last few years. And by the end of 22, it was essentially par with, with biodiesel consumption. Uh, don't have the, the numbers here, but the, between the two of them, 
Yep. Between the two of them, uh, they each uh, they make up about five percent of the, the diesel market in the country. The diesel market is about, about is, is is about sixty billion gallons a year, and here we're at, at more than three billion uh, at the begin at the, at the end of last year, beginning of this year. Uh, looking specifically at California, which is driving uh, the renewable diesel market primarily, uh, although there is rising consumption, although still small in Oregon and Washington State, which both have uh, low carbon fuel standards like California does. Uh, we look at the, the chart there on the right, and it has uh, diesel, so petroleum-based diesel uh, in that light blue, renewable diesel in the red, and biodiesel in the dark blue. And you can see, again, renewable diesel rising steadily. Uh, and, and significantly now in, in the last few years, uh, renewable diesel itself, act sales actually exceeded petroleum-based diesel sales in the first quarter of this year in California. Um, and on an annual basis, we're, we're looking at almost, you know, we're on our way certainly to almost 2 billion gallons of renewable diesel sales in California alone. Uh, that biodiesel number, as you can see, is, has been pretty flat. Uh, translating that into magnitude, if, if all of the renewable diesel and biodiesel used in California came from soybean oil. It would take the oil from about a third of the U.S. soybean crop. So it's substantial. At the same time, to point out that's not the case, I uh, just want to show the magnitude there. But if we look at the actual numbers, only 20% of the gallons of feedstock used to produce renewable diesel in the first quarter in California actually came from soybean oil. Uh, it's still primarily tallow, which has been was has been a long-term feedstock, and, and more recently used cooking oil. The, the, the issue with both of those is they're really capped markets, uh, especially on the tallow side. We're still uh, scrounging up used cooking oil supplies from around the world and sending them to California. But that market, too, it looks like it's almost essentially tapped out, and those numbers will, will start staying steady, and they're going to have to be made up with other vegetable oil, uh, uh, soybean oil, uh, corn oil, and, and canola oil here in, in, in coming months and quarters. But again, just to, to look at that again, if we if all of the renewable diesel was made with soybean oil, it'd be a third of the crop. But again, only one fifth is. So it's still, uh, in terms of total soybean oil produced at the farm level, not actually crushed and physically available, but at the farm level, it's still a relatively small number. So there's still quite a bit of givenness uh, in terms of, of how much growth potential there is with the existing market. Again, we've seen a significant increase in the uh, price of all of these items, uh, but there's still room to go on supplying additional soybean oil to that California market. A lot of language on here, but just want to talk a little bit about margins. Uh, one of the questions that comes up too is as this market builds out, how quickly are these investments, you know, this new industry going to become closer to break even? And we do that with, with tools called margins, uh, just some quick calculations uh, that, that are done uh, we do it for corn ethanol and for soybean crush uh, and, and now renewable diesel as well. You know, the, the, we do this for a couple of reasons. Most importantly, it's, it's a quick snapshot to see if the industry is profitable. Uh, but you can also see more than that. You know, we by, by having that history, you can see if profits are increasing or decreasing. And then by looking at the individual contributors to margin, you can see, you know, what's driving that number on both the revenue and the expense side. So when we calculate margins, typically it's only a few things that we include, primarily because they're the big drivers, uh, and also because those are typically more readily available data. It still might be private data, um, or that, that, for example, that USDA doesn't report, but it's not particularly difficult to find, and there might be one or a number of news services that provide that data. So on the renewable diesel side, obviously the big contributor on the, on, on, in terms of revenue is the actual price of the fuel. Uh, and what we see for other folks who calculate this, we actually just use diesel prices because at the pump, renewable diesel and diesel are indistinguishable. Uh, so that's a pretty good proxy. We don't currently collect uh, retail renewable diesel prices. Uh, I, I'm sure we'll get there soon. We can get it at the wholesale level. But again, for these integrated oil companies, it, it really is that retail number. Uh, that's a little bit more valuable. Also on, on the renewable diesel revenue side, both really important government incentives. Uh, renewable diesel does receive that dollar production tax credit, just like biodiesel does. So that's, that's quite a bit of money. Uh, and then obviously what's driving renewable diesel are low carbon fuel standard uh, policies. And so that 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 carbon credit uh, could be a significant contrib contributor as well. Uh, and then finally, on the expense side, you know, the, the cost of the feedstock, be it soybean oil, used cooking oil, the like, 
you know, having having those four pieces of data, we can calculate margins. And again, it's not going to be precise uh, in terms of the calculation. There's a lot of things that aren't included. Uh, there's also a lot of things that are specific to any given business or refiner if you're looking at them. Uh, but it does help. It is really quite helpful in some of the, the purposes I identified above. Some of the things that are excluded, uh, there are uh, there is a co-product with renewable diesel production. It's actually renewable propane. Uh, we typically don't include that in the margins, although it's sizable, 8 to 10 percent of, of renewable diesel production uh, or, or the feedstock that goes in ends up as propane, which is valuable, obviously, in itself as a fuel. Uh, but also, uh, you know, it is low carbon. So you have that advantage as well. Um, and we typically skip all those other operating expenses, capital expenses, transportation costs, et cetera. For the most part, we think that those are somewhat fixed, they're, they're, especially generally on the, on the operating capital side. They're also really tough. They're very much refinery specific. And so, you know, we don't, just don't have that level of detail unless you really work for the company itself. Uh, and finally, too, we calculate these margins on a gallon equivalent basis, the same thing we do with corn ethanol. So we take all of those revenue and expense numbers and convert them over to that gallon equivalent. So, for example, it takes about eight pounds of vegetable oil to produce a gallon of renewable diesel. So we multiply that per pound price by eight to get the per gallon basis. So finally getting to the punchline, and, and it's actually that dark blue line, which is the margins uh, I calculated for renewable diesel. Uh, and I'll focus on that first just to see. I mean, it's been continues to be profitable. If we see that it was as high as three dollars per gallon, uh, you know, about a year ago, less than a year ago, a substantial amount. Again, there, there's things that aren't included here. Those operate and other capital uh, expenses, but we know at that time that the, the folks involved in this industry were making in excess of a dollar twenty-five, a dollar fifty a gallon, uh, as they reported on their quarterly calls, and so that kind of follows through what's here. Uh, and of course, it's dipped quite a bit, and there's a couple of drivers in that. Uh, one of the big ones is the price of soybean oil uh, is is relatively high, uh, which, which makes a difference. The price of uh, transportation fuel in general, as you may have noticed, that the pump has been lower uh, this summer, and it's and we're about at par where we were last year uh, nationally, and that's almost the case here in California. Uh, the production tax credit is steady, and the carbon credit, the, the value of that is actually a little bit lower. Than, it is actually substantially lower than it was last year. Uh, in terms of its total value, and then a, a slightly smaller contributor to profitability. Uh, if you look at the the quarterly reports, you know that it came out. Say a lot of folks just had their Q2 calls. Uh, folks are still very excited about this. We're going to see additional supply. Um, you know, we're already at half of that market. It's still profitable. There's still things uh, being done in terms of expanding capacity. It's going to come online that will come online here in the next year and coming years where they're already, uh, you know. You know, putting steel in the ground or making these these uh, these transitions to a renewable diesel facility. So, you know, to me, if I look at this, I'd say, well, I'll be, you know, the, the quick takeaway, which you can uh, interpret yourselves as well, uh, that it's still profitable, just not as much as it was. And then, given all these other changes in the market, it, it, it's still profitable. So, those were my comments, and, and that concludes the comments that we had from all of the presentations. Uh, with that, we'll open it up for questions. I see that we have one. Um, and there's more, you know, as they come up, feel free to, to engage uh, with us so we can uh, give you additional information as you might see fit. So the question that's up is uh, a question that's obviously directed at me, although Frank, Frank probably knows what it's talking about. Tim does. Brian's probably like, what on earth is that? Uh, so a question about what's happening to the beat to ethanol research. And the truth is nationally, because we did a lot of that at NDSU and I was involved with it uh, to a large extent. It's really been shelved. Uh, for uh, more than five years. The economics, uh, just like any biofuel right now, are extremely appealing. It's just that there's easier things to do technologically. You know, it, it would, you know, it's easier, obviously, this renewable diesel coming online with significant volumes. Uh, you know, that's going to fill much of this low carbon fuel market. Uh, but I, I do take calls pretty regularly, including one from last week from developers in Nebraska who are interested in it. Uh, I haven't updated the economics. The agronomics are kind of known. You know, the, the 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 feedstock that would be used, even though they, you know, refer to it as an energy beet or industrial beet, you know, to date, that would just be a sugar beet. That uh, would just be destined for uh, biofuel production. Uh, but as I mentioned, I mean, the back of the envelope economics are extremely appealing, just like they are for a lot of biofuels. But it's, you know, it, it, it 
ends up being a bridge too far to really get folks too excited. Uh, the, the people I talked to last week would be looking at putting a new front end on an existing corn ethanol facility uh, to take advantage of uh, of the opportunities. And, and what they were specifically looking at, and I've talked about it before, uh, is the Inflation Reduction Act, which has significant incentives for uh, clean fuel. So they have a clean fuel tax credit, which can pay in excess of a dollar a gallon, which, uh, you know, beet ethanol would be almost certainly be eligible for. You know that, and for for those to to actually to get that credit, you have to have uh, the facility built and in operation uh, within just a few short years here. So there's there's kind of this window in which folks would have to act. Um, but in terms of more uh, broad research, there really hasn't been any. Uh, you know what what was done before, and that included uh, a, we did we did do agronomic work, uh, we did engineering work, and I did some economic work. You know, most of it stands up. You know, it would have to be updated in terms of prices and things like that. It, it, it's just there. Uh, in terms of additional activity, um, you know, there's really not any plan uh, at this time. If and, and if anybody's interested, feel free to give me a call. I mean, if I talk to folks from Nebraska or Idaho, I can certainly talk to folks in the region. Are there any other questions? If not, since it is a beautiful day and it's going to get warm over the weekend, I hope that you guys all have a great weekend and we'll be back next month. Thanks.